Um, my name's Keating. Um, You're seating I, up front? Yeah, yeah, name. please come sit up here. Um, all of you. Um, I work at Terra Firma Farms in um, Southwest Petaluma. Has anyone here ever heard of Terra Firma? Oh yeah, yep. Excellent. So we are a um, multiple species, you know, rotational grazing um, CSA. Does everyone here know what a CSA is? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we are actually the second largest pasture meat CSA in the country. Uh, we have a thousand members who receive um, vegetables and fruits from us um, in various boxes, once, twice, four times a month. Um, Eighteen different cities, seven different. Something. No coyotes around the chickens? Say that. No coyotes around the chickens? Oh, there's coyotes, but we keep them down to a minimum as fast as possible. <laughs> um, so, um, we raise beef, pork, chicken, eggs, turkey, and produce. Um, our goal, um, the heart and soul of our farm, what we're here to do, um, is re-nativize the grassland ecosystem as a whole, um, back to its former glory prior to the gold rush and the introduction of non-native species and um, cattle and continuous grazing and all sorts of terrible stuff. Um, California used to be green 10 months, 12 months out of the year prior to 1845, 1846. Um, it used to be about 50% perennial grasses on the grasslands. It's now less than 1%. Uh, we're trying to get back to perennial grasses, um, keep Northern California green more months a year, have more calories next year in our pasture than there are this year, be able to grow one more steer, 100 more broilers, whatever it is, sustainably um, without overusing the land. Um, we use holistic management, ranching for profit, and a bunch of different tools, both ecologically and um, economically um, to help um, emphasize land rest and the nutrient cycle and the water cycle and make sure um, we're taking the ecology of the pro property into account um, as much as we are um, the economics or anything like that that drives farming typically. Um, so um, we try to use cattle through intensive grazing um, to bring back native species of grass and um, grow more perennials without seeding or irrigating. Um, in doing so, we've had experts tell us because of our brittle, dry environment, um, with only you know four to five months of precipitation a year, it would take in excess of 125 years um, to get back to 50, 60 percent perennials, um, which is okay, and we're we're still happy and eager to um, start that process. Um, but through things like biochar and um, intensive grazing and pasture poultry, um, we believe that we can do it in about 75, 80 years um, and kind of expedite this process um, within you know our definition of sustainable at the farm. And so. Pasture poultry play a big role. Uh, we do seasonal turkey in the fall, which is what we're doing right now. We got some six and eight week olds out there, and it's a nightmare. I'm chasing around all over the place. Um, we do broilers. We do about 12,000 Cornish crosses a year on our property. Um, we can do 18, 20 a year, uh, but we choose not to. Next year, we're going to do a few less. Um, our property is really hilly, really steep. There's only so many areas we can, we can do uh, poultry. We only can access take our poultry infrastructure to so many locations. Um, we used to do salads and style chicken tractors. Is everyone here familiar with that? Um, so we used to do 12,000 birds a year in salads and style chicken tractors, which is a lot of work. Um, we've since moved to the day range uh, methodology of raising poultry. Um, you can see the infrastructure in those pictures. We use large hoop houses that move weekly um, to different ridge tops and low-lying flatlands where we can access. Um, and the hope is um, we'll raise really healthy um, antibiotic-free, unadulterated, highly nutritious uh, poultry, whether it's eggs, chicken, or turkey, uh, while also stimulating the microbial activity in the soil and leaving behind a lot of fertilizer and hopefully um, stimulating the ecology of the whole and cleaning up after the cattle and the hogs uh, to hopefully um, mitigate the use of any synthetic inputs, whether it be antibiotics or vaccinations in the future, um, by using multiple species um, in symbiosis with one another, the farmer, the land, um, all that. That said, um, the first group, I kind of had a structured chat and we talked a lot about a lot of things. And the second group asked a couple good questions in the first 90 seconds and we covered nothing I wanted to cover, but it was great. So um, I think this would be best if um, you guys have certain niches of anything I do that um, you really want to hear from me because we only have a few minutes. Feel free to just ask a ton of questions. I can keep just talking about what we do, um, but ultimately I'd love to be a resource to you and help you guys um, answer questions you have. Essentially, you're a grass farmer. I'm a grass farmer. All right. Proud to be one. Okay, so what about in the area you got a lot of wind? that area and a lot of drift. Yeah. Um, what do you do as far as your buffers for as you're trying to reestablish the perennial seed bank? Um, what are you doing with buffers from seeds coming in, from birds flying over, and from dormant seeds such as thistle that'll stay 50 years in the soil? So, a um, few different things. Uh, that's a really, really good question that I could talk for a really long time about. Um, I'd say the main thing that would be the most simplistic and hopefully most people here would understand is that um, when we take our, we have 300 acres on the home property, um, we now have satellite properties that we're going to extend our production to all species, to different animals, or to different properties, but on the home site, um, when we rationed out the grass and built our semi-permanent infrastructure and built those you know, power lines going to the back of the property that we can then cross fence and 
intensively graze the cattle through, we try to use key line design and use the ridges and the swales and the valleys to our advantage to help dictate, um, hey, if this grass is going to be knocked down, then should this grass still be standing lignin carbon to help the drift going down to bother the chickens or keep the seed back on that fence line. Um, we also do other stuff, whether it's cutting fire breaks by overgrazing cattle at the end of the wet season along the fence line to, you know, bear out the ground. But ultimately, we're trying to not overuse any aspect of the ground and keep a ton of thatch or um, standing residual or lignin carbon, whatever you want to call it, um, on any given prop area of our property so that we aren't leaving our susceptible to wind erosion. We don't till, we don't do any of that. Um, that said, animal impact is a huge part of what we do and we love seeing cattle tear up the land because um, that's a good thing. Um, that said, cows are never on any given acre of our property for more than 40 or 48 hours a year. Um, so, you know, we ration out our grass and put them in really small paddocks, you know, mimicking the buffalo um, to have a similar effect to build topsoil, sequester carbon, increase organic matter. All that good stuff. Any other questions? What's the productivity rate of the, uh, your layers in the houses versus other designs? So the hoop houses are for the meat meat production. That's an egg mobile. Right. Um, that's more what we use for um, the hen production. We have a few different designs, um, mainly um, you know up off the ground on old um, mobile home trailers. We build custom. Um, eggmobiles. We also have some that are like A-frames on sleds. Um, we have a bunch of different things. Um, the productivity at the height of right now it's falling off faster than we know what to do about. Um, but at the height of the season in the June or so, uh, we are about 82 to 84 percent, and we never go below 63 percent, um, which is awesome. You know, we have a lot of neighbors who do egg production, um, and we're able to see what they're doing and see what their numbers are. And we don't use artificial light. We don't use egg boosting probiotics. We don't do anything but let them follow the ruminants or the pigs or you know, be idling in the back corner of the property, not near anything to kind of clean out their system and um, take good care of them. You make sure they have a really good feed ration full of, you know, nutrient-dense greens and other things, and um, they perform for you. You're a happy hen, you know, not a well-fed hen. You want to restrict feed. You don't want to give them too much. Fat hen is not a productive hen. Um, but, you know, just take good care of them and look, you know, that's what Orlando says, sing to them. Um, and, you know, just keep them happy and, and very closely watch their needs and the health of the flock as a whole. Um, and it's, uh, it's not... It's not terrible. They uh, they can be very very productive. Um, this is a great picture actually. Um, this is you know part of our herd um, being moved through a hillside, and you can see the hen house just you know a few paddocks behind them. Um, and we do that intensively. So we have three hen houses currently. You guys can keep passing these around. Oh. Um, so one hen house is always idling, where we're giving them diatomaceous earth and garlic and vinegar to kind of deworm them naturally with things you and I could find in our kitchen, um, while letting them have six weeks away from all the other animals to just clean out their system and take care of themselves. While, you know, another house is behind the biggest group of hogs, or um, one house is always behind the biggest group of um, cattle when we can access, you know, that part of the property. And so um, they're always coming behind and cleaning up and eating through their feces, which they benefit from because bird species and ruminants or um, herbivores have co-evolved for 24 million years and digestive enzymes as well as microflora and microbiology of the cattle's gut as well as the, the poultry, in our case, or even the native birds, um, are mutually beneficial. And so our animals scratching through our other animals' feces is a good thing, um, both nutritionally for their byproduct, whether it be meat or eggs, um, but also um, because, you know, the chickens going through there and eating the, the, the fly larvae and the maggots as well as the worms and the parasites mean not only are the cattle not going to have a fly problem this year, we're not going to be having um, to do treatment for pink eye or what have you, but next year when the cattle come through that same section or next season when the cattle come through that same paddock, we don't have to be using deworming agents or antibiotics or vaccinations because we know um, that that pasture is clean and those cattle are um, going to be just fine. So we have lost some population. We have a team of tiny flock, 56. Hens? Yeah. Okay. Four layers. First time doing it. So is, do, you, do you find this uh, fencing adequate for bogcats, this type of electric fence? No. Like um, when I started Terra Firma, I put the fencing back in the barn. Um, we have four poultry houses, hoop houses for meat production, and three hen houses for um, laying production. Um, right now we have like 600 birds, but we want to have about 1,000. Next season, probably 1,500 laying Lame. hens. Uh -huh. And um, if a coyote wants to go in or a bird wants to come out, it's going to happen. That's not doing anything. Um, I have to move those hen houses two to five times a week, mm -hmm. and the broiler pads at least once a week. There's two of us doing the whole farm. I can't do the netting and the tie downs right. and the little nuanced pieces. So what we do in our economics is we know that we're going to lose a certain number of our flock, a certain percentage of our flock to predation, whether mostly aerial crows, hawks, and ravens. And then we also know that we're going to lose a percentage of them to Merrick's disease, particularly leukoid lymphosis, which is a complication of Merrick's. Uh, we could vaccinate for it, but if you do the economics and we know that we're going to lose about approximately 13 to 15% of our flock each year to predation and disease, the cost of the labor to do the fencing 
or the labor to do the observation and the hunting of the predators or the individual cost for shots and vaccinations, it, it makes more sense for us in our particular situation to not use netting and not use vaccinations and not use antibiotics in the feed and just prepare ourselves for that loss and um, collect the eggs, incubate them and be prepared. So if we have a thousand hens, next year we want to introduce 150, 75 in the spring, 75 in the fall. Just, you know, how we, how we prepare um, to fight predation and stuff. That way, you know, we also we also put that kind of stuff up to our membership to decide, are you okay, would you prefer um, we do this or this? Would you like vaccinated hens to lay your eggs or non-vaccinated hens? And they, they chose a non-vaccinated, so we're gonna make it work for them. And then with your reintroduction into your thousand, if you bring in 150, are you always having multi-age hens within a single flock? Absolutely. Um, there's benefits to not doing that, absolutely. Yes and no. Um, we used to do tagging, now it's easy enough by eye. Also, we're getting um, to the point where we're, we're, we have 18 heritage varieties that um, come from England and 25 heritage varieties on the property, and we're crossbreeding for um, forageability, productivity, coloring, different things that we're looking for. We also read a study um, by Tem Temple Brandon about um, choosing males for chicken breeding, and um, we're looking for the best answers, um, as opposed to you know size or egg color or different things that the industry's chosen for over the years. So we're trying to get back to how chickens would have naturally bred and who would have won out um, in, you know, the sort of hardiness or this type of thing kind of letting evolution take its course, but also breeding for little nuanced things that we want within our program that we also think can achieve sustainability and not dictate this breed or species down the wrong path. Okay. That said, we are so, looking for a variety of color in our dozen, right, as right. well as good uniform size and different things so like that. So you can just kind of tell who's oldest and youngest based on your breeding and kind of when this particular would have been introduced, you wouldn't have had this hen a year ago, and so this hen is clearly a new hen. Right now, I have about 600 hens. I could tell the majority of them apart from them. I could tell you when, where, what batch, when it was introduced, if it lived in that house last month or it just migrated over here by its eye. It's just, you know, I'm in the field every day. I know we have 350 hogs, I can tell you each one apart from that. I know that they're within the, the, the uh, chickens, they certainly have their pecking order, so they have their own social structure. And Absolutely. Outside of confinement with free range, um, you know, access to an abundance of resources, um, water, area, space, pasture, bugs, grubs. When you're not limiting resources, the pecking order is far less intense and we don't find problems. Uh, the one problem we sometimes have is too many roosters to hang and we get, you know, little back sores and stuff like that, but it's not hard to pull, that, pull back the, uh, the rooster population and make a little soup or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correction. Do you uh, compost your mortalities, uh, chicken mortalities, things like that? Or we do, and we also um, are a big believer of poultry and hogs being omnivores. So the blood from our poultry processing goes to our pigs. The guts from healthy, healthy poultry processing batches go to pigs. Sometimes the offal. Um, we feed chicken to pig, and, um, and you know, beef liver and pork liver to chicken, and different things like that. If, you know, a group of hens isn't looking healthy. We're gonna go grind up some pork liver and feed them because we know our pork liver is really nutritious and great and can help stimulate Which the health of the farm. You're, you're very careful not to trip and fall in your pig pot, in your pig uh, area. That's true. <laughs> they'll eat you up, right? <laughs> no, no. Luckily, our dogs are pretty friendly. Um, <laughs> boss pushes the docile pig thing. You know. All the animals are uh, way too friendly, actually. And they're spoiled rotten, <laughs> especially the breeding hogs. Um, but, but yeah, no. There's there's you know pretty strict protocol about composting our property. Things have to be in, you know put down a certain number of inches in the compost pile. It has to be put in there within, you know, you can't leave it in the back of the truck for a day or whatever, you know, that's a problem with interns or what have you. Um, even our current staff, you know, we just, um, we don't want to put too many in one area of the compost, so we want to spread them out. And, you know, it can become a problem, but we also don't have a ton of loss. Um, you know, or broiler batches, predation and disease, per 450 birds, we'll get 420, 422 up to weight, you know, less than 7% uh, mortality, which is, 40% of the industry standard, and they don't have predation, and they use antibiotics and vaccination. So um, we're not dealing with a ton of loss, which is nice. We also work really closely with the lab in Davis when we have birds we're wondering what's going on with, we'll euthanize them and send them in. When birds die, we always send them into the lab. Hen, broiler, turkey, it doesn't matter. We just had a massive problem with our turkey slip tendon or porosis. We lost 40% of our, our fall flock to um, overheating in the brooder. Um, lack of space, they had 28% protein feed. We went with higher protein ration this year um, and didn't give them enough space and gave them too much heat. And the tendon slipped off their legs and they never regained the strength to walk. And we just had to put away 
you know, 40% of our flock because of a mistake in the brooding stage, which is a big yeah. issue um, and costly, um, but it's good to learn from your mistakes, mistakes like that and not ever do that again. Um, but also, there's so many things, you know, you own chickens, you know, one day you'll go out to the house and you see a dead chicken, you just don't know what to do with it or what happened, and it's great to have that relationship with the lab in Davis where you can send them in for a very reasonable price um, and find out exactly what's going on. Um, I mean, it's so preventive because if something is wrong, you're, you know about it up front as opposed to, you know, when you've hit a critical... Uh, critical mass, we try not to reach that, but also knowing and compiling that feedback and looking at it and analyzing it chronologically as to what was going wrong, we use a lot of preventative care, not vaccinations and antibiotics, but vinegar or garlic or diatomaceous earth or greens or nutrient-dense <laughs> produce or what have you to increase the health. But if we find out that there's this going on in that house, then we can be more precise with our, our treatment and our preventative care and um, amplify dosages of what happened if we need it. We have guests coming in a lot. My owner is not big on the biosecurity thing. Uh, this is my farm. Uh, it, I just came from a farm with 4,500 chickens, 350 hogs, mm -hmm. 100 head of cattle. You know, I would have made myself probably stop in some lime or diatomaceous earth or something. Um, each farm's different. Um, legally speaking, I don't think we have to do anything. Um, I think it's, it's smart to do, particularly around hogs. That said, um, we're in Petaluma, uh, poultry capital of the world. There's more soil and airborne chicken than there. I think trying to do biosecurity around chickens is a lot of effort for very little results, uh, but around pigs, I think it's a big issue. Uh, I think heritage hogs are more resistant, and we don't have to do as much, especially because we don't allow people in the paddocks with the hogs. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a great question. It's something I'm undereducated on, and I'm curious about myself. Um, biosecurity is a huge issue, but um, on sustainable organic farms with older breeds of, of species, and um, both flora and fauna, it seems to be less of an issue. Those those raised in confinement um, and selectively bred to the industrial agricultural complex last few decades um, are more resistant to this stuff and, and critical mass can be reached a lot quicker. Luckily, you and I have put ourselves in positions not to do that. So, um, Tara, Tara Firma Firms, uh, do you do your own marketing or do you, you do we your do. own We do. It's a huge part of our business. So we have two people who work the ranch, but we have nine full-time employees. We have a CSA and farm store open seven days a week with free educational tours on the weekend. We have a store um, and a distribution company. We sell goods from 15 other small farms in Southern Sonoma County. Um, what's that? A website. We do have a website, terraformerfarms.com. Um, I think I have some pamphlets left. I don't know if my folder's been completely rated yet. Um, if not, I have some car cards in my car. Um, but yeah, we have tours on Saturday and Sunday, and we, um, you know, we probably have in the summer sometimes 200 people a weekend to our farm. Um, the store's open seven days a week, and um, just people all the time. We're a destination farm. It's all about education. There's a lake for people to come to. You can bike, hike, picnic. We have like a trail being built for like the staging area, stuff like that. Um, there's a bunch going on. So it's a very, uh, really good representation of what you do. Well, I think that this is impressive, certainly for my end. I, I just, uh, I know I was supposed to come and talk about pasture poultry, but like the first two groups were like, that's nice. What else do you have to say? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> um, I'm trying to cover as much as possible. We talked a lot about CSA and direct marketing to consumers, and that's a huge issue. You know, we had to decide, do we want to? direct market or do we want to go wholesale? Do we want to pay for our marketing efforts? Do we want to bring someone in from the outside to do it? So right now we have someone we just hired and contracted to do our social marketing in terms of Facebook and Twitter. So we don't know anything about that. <laughs> Turns out it's very important. <laughs> it, it does. And um, having the right people knowing what they're doing is important. Um, is anyone here kind of dealing with the cost analysis of doing wholesale as opposed to retail or direct marketing as opposed to selling into the system? You know, that's a really interesting thing based on your product. For us, it makes sense to pay the premium um, and the labor for the people in the office to bring people in for our CSA and, and, and pay, for, pay our way through our CSA as opposed to taking the pay cut in our product um, and hope that we have to do less work in terms of chasing down that money, but we went down that path a little, um, or some of us have, or friends of ours have, and chasing money from a restaurant for 90 days isn't as fun and sometimes takes more labor than marketing your CSA. And so for each farm, it's different. For every single farm, no matter if you do pork and I do pork or what have you, it's just every situation is super unique, and you just have to figure out what makes sense Hold for on. your group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I went to your farm just I think it was a week ago with um, LSR Leadership Santa Rosa. Mm -hmm. You guys have a great farm, and it's impressive mm -hmm. that Tara started this like just a few years ago, right? Yeah, well, she wasn't even a in farmer. April. She was like in. She's in. She was in a long-term care insurance business for several right. decades. Yeah, they uh, they were not into agriculture in any capacity. They came across a few different pieces of literature and expose documentary film work in 2007, 2008. Got really curious, angry, excited, frustrated with our current agricultural production system, and um, figured that they could have the most profound impact 
uh, by starting a farm and educating a consumer base um, about real wholesome unadulterated food and they've done an incredible job of that um, in a very short period of time. And they're opening a dormitory, right, for students to go live on the farm? And yeah, we're, we're currently in the process of writing a curriculum for an intern program next summer where we can have, uh, we're also building out barracks and whatnot to have live on interns on the property. You made it sound nicer than it's going to be, I think, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's in the back of a barn, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, we're definitely, um, the first 24 months, we tried a bunch of different stuff and implemented other people's models like salad tins and weren't 100% profitable and weren't 100% satisfied with our ecosystem services and accomplishing our goals, our fundamental values as a team. And um, we've slowly evolved and developed our own infrastructure and made new values and, and um, new goals around what we think we can accomplish ecologically on our property. And, um, now, in the last few months, not only has the property, the you know, business as a whole become profitable this summer. Um, Forecasting going forward, it looks good. Um, each enterprise of production on the farm, whether it be beef, pork, chicken, eggs, produce, is within itself profitable as well. Um, and now we get to work on our other farm goals, like educating community and growing new farmers and all these other stuff. Now we get to put our time and energy into that, uh, as well as finances, which is exciting. So is your mat overall site management plan based on your own um, sort of insights and experiences, or is it following some guidelines like ISO 9000 program or some other kind of uh, certifying or guiding? I would say it's a mix of both. I think we started out with Salton style model, um, and then we started implementing things from Alan Savory's Holistic Management Institute, and then we started using Dave Pratt's um, Ranching for Profit School as well as his Ranching for Profit Consultants company and their books and their information. And, um, started looking really closely at our business and our economics um, and trying to find an honest representation of what our economics really look like. Um, we have a gentleman who works for us, Byron Palmer, who is incredible in terms of what he looks at. He understands that um, you have to look at your comparative cost. We can't just say, oh yeah, this is profitable because this is our cost and this is our revenue and this is why it's profitable. No. If we were to lease this property, or if we were to use all the commodities on this property and sell the wind, water, and solar rights, how much more can we make? What are our comparative advantages within each acre of our property? Are we getting the best value by farming it?